the photovoltaic, which are solar panels made out of anything green, including grass clippings, to sense olfaction in the sense of smell, uh, to cures for cancer, to discovering drugs, and to managing pain. My group at MIT is called Label Free Research. So everybody asks, so what do you guys do? Well, we specialize. We specialize in not specializing. In fact, I tell my students and my collaborators, once you get really good at something, you should stop doing it. No longer belongs in my group because by definition, as Einstein said, research is when you don't know what you're doing. Once you get good at it, then it becomes industry. And that's what we learn how to um, also learn a lot. So I brought with me several remarkable people who I want, I will embarrass them by making them stand up and I will talk a little bit about what they do with me or on their own. And uh, the first couple are um, Grassi, Willis, Carlis, and um, John Dunn. Would you please stand up and show your faces because I would like, please get up, 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 up. Oh, yes. 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 what we've done uh, with them, and, and you'll see the, the sort of the breadth of subjects that have been covered. They do have an intellectual connective tissue. It may not be apparent. You can ask me later how we come up from one to the next. But um, one thing that um, happened was um, uh, I, I happened to be a pilot. I do it for fun, not for transportation. And I've noticed that my state of flow while I'm flying my plane is uh, uh, very, very cool. I, I process a lot of information. I'm using my hands, my feet. I'm listening to the radio, I'm talking to my passengers, I'm talking to APC, I'm looking at the map, I'm looking outside, I'm flying this plane, and I'm having fun, and my brain works really wonderfully. And can you hear me in the back? Yeah, so I think I have good network. So I thought, what if I recorded my brain waves while I'm doing this and tried to use neurofeedback to bring this kind of state into my office and maybe become a super scientist though? Well, that didn't work very well for many practical reasons, such as having the headphones in the, in the plane interfering with the headbands that are available for measuring EEG, which are now 300 bucks by Muse and only a few lectures, and they're just as good as the 30 lecture things you get clinically. So I thought next best thing is, well, let's um, I use this while I'm driving my motorcycle real fast, because that also puts my brain in a nice state of flow. That had safety implications. So I thought, uh, <laughs> So I thought, well, let's first, before I start hacking helmets and, you know, booking time on racetracks and things like this, let's start, let's figure out if it's going to work at all. So I wanted an unambiguous signal from the outside that I could say one mental state, one perceptual state versus another. So what's the simple thing, simplest thing to do was to torture some people and ask them to put their hand in cold water and therefore create a pain state and then record this and then also uh, try and differentiate it from a non-pain state. So we did this with grass here, and without realizing, it took us over a year after we published this, we realized, hold on a minute, we just made the world's first pain measuring device. That didn't exist before, and I was very pissed off because this is a state of the art in hospital to measure your pain. <laughs> in 2016, that is not a good state of affairs. It has many implications for the opiate addiction crisis, it has many implications for surgery, there's now clinical studies going on about whether we should be giving painkillers while uh, under general anesthesia. And then John uh, came over, and he is an expert in rotation tanks and meditation. Um, and we know that there's a lot of good, good reasons for doing these things. And we decided, why don't we try and now do the original experiment only without the, the plane, but instead record the meditative state while in the rotation tank and bring you a your feedback solution so you can do it at home. The most important thing we learned from this so far is this graph here. If I calibrate on myself and teach the machine to interpret my uh, mental, um, my perceptual state, and I use it on you, no matter how many classifiers, no matter how many numbers of features I use from the signal, I can never get above about 67% accuracy. If I calibrate on myself and use it on myself, after about seven, num uh, seven features, I'm getting close to 100% accuracy. Even with the worst classifier, it's 0.4 seconds for something like this to interface with something like this and tell you whether you're in pain, whether you're in meditative state, etc. Many applications for this are the lesson for everybody doing AI and uh, biosensing and wearables is please stop making me calibrate myself to the machine first and then making the machine tell me what to do. Let's do it the other way around. We have enough computational capacity to calibrate the machine to self. I don't, not the other way around. Lots of people are doing it the other way around, which is why all of these applications for meditation and mindfulness and ADHD, etc., don't work. They're calibrated to an average brain. There's no such thing as an average brain. Human variability from human to human is so vast 
and it's so easy to calibrate yourself that you should be just doing that. Um, now, I want to talk about Silicos and uh, uh, Shannon. Please stand up, show yourselves. There you go. Silicos <laughs> came to me with um, a technology that I was thinking about doing 10 years ago, and I abandoned it because it was not quite mature. And he invited me to his lab in, in uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, where he single handedly almost with his advisor, of course, uh, almost figured it out, which is to encapsulate stem cells in fibers that can be printed in a 3D fashion such that we can print scaffolds of organs and then perfuse them with your own stem cells that will come out of your, let's say, olfactory epithelium, which is a, a disposable piece of brain that we can rip out of your head and after two weeks it regrows. And it's full of stem cells that can be used and have been already shown to be successful in this, uh, to, to regrow organs. Um, so please go and talk to him, especially those of you interested in um, um, this kind of uh, technology. Shannon and I uh, did something cool recently. We took uh, second place in the um, Evolton competition, which was um, to create bacteria that can outcompete other bacteria at, at certain temperatures. And in this case, it was to grow at lower temperatures. And in doing so, we again stumbled across some couple of cool things. So what? We called our strategy was the United States of E. coli. E. coli are a certain kind of bacteria. And in thinking about what the other 14 teams were doing and how to compete against them, everybody else was trying to design a gene that would make the bacteria grow very really efficiently, <coughs> stuff it into, um, into the uh, genome of the E. Of the coli, and etc. We decided to do something different. We took our originally barcoded bacteria broke them up into 613 different colonies and exposed them to different mutagens and different life experiences and then made them all back into one country, sort of like what we think is happening in the multicultural society such as the United States. We ended up beating every other team in the fastest growth and what we ended up creating, I think, is a multicultural culture that is best at adapting to the unknown because what's happening is up to 30% of our um, genomes in, the, in this culture are there because of horizontal gene transfer, meaning that the weak or the less you know, thriving members of our community, they, when they die, they get overtaken by the other members, they don't actually lose, we don't actually lose information and the knowledge that they have brought to us. In fact, we store these genes and we have a genetic memory. Now, this brings us to a controversial, slightly uh, application, which we're still thinking through the uh, safety implications of it, but uh, it looks like we can solve the problems that will appear to you in a minute, but, and we can do the following thing to uh, battle antibiotic resistance bacteria. Um, it's very obvious that there's millions of people carrying in themselves strains of bacteria that will have absolutely no antibiotics to kill them. These people will die from this, unless they have something else first, and or they will give it to other people. And one way is to create new antibiotics, sure, and there's part of my work is uh, around that. Another way is new, which is this. If we've created a kind of infection that is better at competing for the same resources as your, let's say, antibiotic resistant infection, we can infect you with my infection, it will outcompete your infection, and then I will kill my infection because my infection is killable. I will have created it in such a way that I can flip a switch and it will die. For instance, we can recode the, uh, uh, anti uh, the amino acid codon such that it has to use something that you must drink in, while in the hospital. Once you stop having that food source, my bacteria will not only live, so that's one safety feature. So towards that, we have created some technologies such as, for instance, this is a microfluidic um, uh, whole genome transplantation uh, device where each one of these dots is a microplasma cell that gets exploded. We wash away the cytoskeleton and we keep just, you can see this, we keep just the DNA. This is intact, uh, 1.2 million base pair DNAs. Uh, we can then transplant them into other cells and with these microfluidic devices, which by the way cost about 10 cents, and they're right here for anybody to come and look, and we've created them in a way that you can click them together with your fingers, you no longer need to use. The state of the art, by the way, in this field has been uh, GSWT, graduate student with tweezers. So, uh, <laughs> so now we can use um, um, research scientists with fat fingers, and it's a little better than that. So, and um, just today we actually filed for patents, I can talk to you about this very quickly. This all led us to create what are called Sinels, which are synthetic cell analogs, which marks the first time we can actually digitally transmit genetic information at the speed of light, which means I can broadcast the contents of a cell that you have a sort of 3D printer at your end. I've designed something, you can be on Mars, and you can create, let's say, a leather-producing um, uh, colony uh, at your end without having to go through all the um, difficulty uh, in creating this. Uh, Michael 
It's okay. Can we stand up? Where is he? There he is. Um, <laughs> Michael uh, uh, programmed my st temporal stereoscope. This was an attempt to uh, induce déjà vu. Uh, déjà vu is an interesting thing. Some people have felt it. Many people uh, haven't. But the point is, we don't know what it is. We'd like to study it. How to induce it? Nobody knew. So I thought, well. How about we do this, um, we all know what stereoscopy is, we have two ears and we can hear sounds and we can figure out the direction of the sound because there is a delay between the two ears uh, because sound goes at 300 meters per second, light goes uh, at 3 times 78 meters per second, so nobody in this room, apart from the people who tried our temporal stereoscope, has ever experienced a temporal delay between the two eyeballs. So we created this and then we realized, holy, this is, this is something you can get. Now it didn't, doesn't quite induce déjà vu. But it does something weird, so I uh, encourage you to go and check it out. Uh, not if you're epileptic, because I think it's going to trigger seizures. <laughs> um, then there's Anne Sophie Barwich, who is, uh, where is she? Please stand up, where is she? Now, I don't, she works on this problem, which I'll let it uh, kind of see back on its own. And uh, she, uh, the, this is not work that we've done together, but she is one of the smartest people to talk about olfaction, which is a sense uh, of smell. And she is what she, she calls herself a bench philosopher. She's also the presidential scholar in neuroscience of Columbia, and I encourage you to go look at her poster tomorrow. So quickly about our technologies. This is bits from bits to atoms. On the left hand side here have photosystem one, which is the, at the heart of the energy of the Earth's energy cycle. Everything you eat, etc., is basically stored solar power, which came to you via this process where light comes up here, energetic collections emerge and plants and other photosynthetic organisms store it as chemical energy that you can consume or you can put it into your uh, gas tank as a uh, you know, dead dinosaur or something like that. These are membrane proteins, meaning that they sit inside of a membrane, having water on both sides. What we learned in uh, creating the world's most efficient biophotovoltaic by taking this out, putting it on nanowires, and integrating with electronic circuitry was how to control, how to keep in stasis these living proteins in contact with electronic circuitry. This brought us directly to the next one, which is GPCRs, G-protein coupled receptors, about 80% of all pharmacology and pharma R&D, which we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars per year, goes into trying to figure out targets and trying to figure out ligands, that means compounds that will interact with these transmembrane um, uh, proteins. And the Technology is similar. Once we learn how to stabilize this, we went to this. So this makes photovoltaics. So this makes noses. There's a nose. And there's the intellectual connective tissue between the two is this technology that allows us to keep them alive outside of a cell membrane, which are these molecules. And this is sort of a cartoon of what happens in nature. There's a membrane about five nanometers from here to here. Water, water. And these lipids, their tails are hydrophobic and they keep the guts of the protein together. And that's how this machinery works, which which has, by the way, 100% quantum efficiency, and nothing, anything close like that to that by human engineering has never been achieved. So we take this out of the plant and we stabilize it in an artificial environment. We use these quartz. And this became very good and famous and went to the museums. But the problem was we have to have a monolayer and how to increase the efficiency if you only have one layer of proteins. Well, how do plants do it? And there's uh, membranes and things like that you can look at. But I was in Japan once and I saw this picture. And I took a picture of this tree which uh, is cheating with respect to his brothers and sisters by having some leaves on this trunk. Any photos that come through here don't get eaten by the canopy, get eaten by this guy, the other guys don't do that. So I said, well, let's make a nano version of this, a nano forest, so let's take some carbon nanotubes, which were very much in vogue at the time. I put our proteins on top of those to increase the efficiency. Can anybody see what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is, <laughs> and I should have seen this, carbon nanotubes are very, very black. So it's like the trunks will absorb the light if you don't get it in the first chance and create uh, heat instead of electricity. That's no good. If black tree trunks are bad, what's best? What's better than that? Well, transpired ones. And it ends up being that actually making transpired uh, nano trunks is easier than making carbon nanotubes uh, using zinc oxide um, uh, solvable thermally deposits, which means that you can do it in a very dirty vat of water. This became very famous and led to the next one, which is. Um, the GPCRs. Now, Michael, who did the stereo uh, temporal stereoscope, also did this animation, which is a supercomputer-based uh, animation of what happens when a odorant molecule, this is a molecule that we, when we experience it, we have a sensation of scent, uh, interacts with a receptor. So this is, again, five nanometers. This is now 
slowed down so you can see what's happening, but note how everything is jiggling around. This happens at 37C. And we know now that the correct uh, way to think about this is no longer lock and key. This is a completely inappropriate way to think about it. If you think of uh, pharmacology and all of molecular biology that has to do with, oh, if these two things just touch just right, that's how recognition happens. Nope. Look at how jiggly everything is. Conformations change. Everything's labile, meaning it's flexible. It's like a bunch of spaghetti jiggling together. So what we know now is it's the number of conformational states that both molecules assume per unit time that determines um, recognition. And this has deep implications, not only on olfaction, but also on drug design, on cancer, and um, other things. Uh, Trask, who uh, also did the EEG, uh, also did this. Again, on olfaction, we took something that is done classically with uh, uh, supercomputers and crystallography, and did a different approach, which was, let's look at what's conserved in the amino acid sequence across 200 different human olfactory receptors, and let's also look at what's conserved in the sequence across uh, 11 different animals. And we were managed. We managed to get the same results as about two or three years worth of very hard work in about five seconds of computation time. And this leads us to understand better some very interesting facts about olfaction, which go very deep into biology. For instance, if you think that the shape of the molecule determines its function, you're wrong. These molecules here all have the same scent, and they all smell of musk. Musk smells like flowers. Why does musk smell like flowers? Why do flowers smell like flowers? Why does proteum smell like flowers? Because in all cases, the functionality is to attract attention of a pollinator. In all cases, the thing that's making these things wants to mate. So, uh, that's kind of deep. There's uh, other uh, deep things I can tell you about this. Ask me at dinner. Uh, some other facts, fun facts about olfaction. There's many conventional wisdom things that are wrong. Dogs are not better than humans at sniffing stuff. In fact, this here is a dog chasing a pheasant. This here is a Catholic, I think, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, who is blindfolded and he's chase, or she is chasing after a chocolate. And they're doing the same thing. They, yes, the dog does have more receptors than the human. The human has 400, the dog has 800. But the reason dogs are better at sniffing is because they're easier to motivate. And how much money would you want? If I ask you to get on all fours and sniff all the luggage in the airport. <laughs> Another misconception is that humans, you can hear these uh, headlines everywhere, they go in for anyway like, oh, humans can uh, smell 10,000 cents, that's in textbooks, completely wrong. And another one says, oh, no, no, it's actually only seven. Another one says, no, it's actually one trillion. So they can't, none of them is right. It's asking how many cents you can recognize is asking how many poems can you remember, how many... Um, uh, Movies can you recognize or tell apart how many songs, etc. It has to do with attention, memory, and motivation. We taught Drosophila to sniff out isotopes. So if you still think it's about structure, then you're having to say that Drosophila does nuclear physics because isotopes are the same molecule where the change is only in adding a neutron to, uh, to deuterate a molecule, but adding a neutron to the hydrogen in there. Drosophila certainly does not know chemistry and doesn't know uh, anything about nuclear physics. Yet, we managed to uh, teach them how to think about isotopes. This became very big, and I think it's some kind of record, because we published in PNAS, and both Nature and Science covered it in the same day, on the same day. Which takes more effort, I think, than actually publishing it in Nature and Science, which they think they missed out. Beyond just the academic part of it, why is this, what are the practical applications you can be thinking about? There's two that we were already, already working with our sponsors, who are GlaxoSmithKline. One is in vaccine development, where we're replacing the adjuvant, that means the irritant that we put in vaccines to call the attention of the immune system, we're replacing it with an olfactory cue. So instead of having to take your baby three or four times to get vaccinated with booster shots, or risking a, actually having a, 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 a bad reaction because we're putting too much of the attenuated virus in, we are calling the attention of the immune system by adding um, a scent. And the other thing is about painkillers. So we're teaching, we're associatively conditioning brains of humans now, we've already done this in animals and it works and we're going to do it in humans soon, to associate the morphine clicker that they are on after, let's say, um, hip replacement surgery. They're in a lot of pain, they're on a morphine clicker. Every time they get, give themselves a bolus of morphine, we also give them a scent. Eventually we send them home with a chewing gum that has a little bit of painkiller and the same scent and uh, gradually we dial down the painkiller in uh, favor of the scent. Now, it is a placebo effect. But it is a new kind of placebo effect without the lies. We don't have to lie to anybody about what's happening. We're very upfront about training your brain to gain conscious control of your pain. Uh, we also built uh, the world's first and currently 
Only the sephora that knows it can tell you what something smells of, as opposed to what it's made of. This was made by Dark with a very large grant. Then it shrunk, and it keeps shrinking, and now it's this big. It's going to go into your cell phone, we hope one day. Uh, just as a fun thing, who knows what this is? Just raise your hand quickly. Nobody, huh? Of course wow. Young crowd. Now? <laughs> okay. So to understand and wrap your heads around what does it mean to have a nose in your phone, which is categorically not an analytical tool, it's not a mass spec, uh, consider what you can do with a trained dog, which has versatility, that means you can train it on a rose and it can find you another flower, or you can train it on a rose and it can find you the rose in the flower store. These are the various applications. Uh, dogs have been, uh, as of last year, allowed, and it, they're in insurance reimbursable diagnostic in, in hospitals in the United Kingdom. They're better than any other diagnostic we have for early cancer detection. And uh, let me just uh, finish by uh, giving you something very scary. This is supposedly a very hopeful slide. We have a number of new process structures, human genome, all these things that are happening. Uh, Everything is looking good, right? Now check out this curve. This is number of new drugs we discovered per billion dollars worth of research in 1950. This is now. This ends with the next drug in 2020 costing $100 billion, which is more than the average big pharma company. And um, this really means that we don't know what we're doing. Our faction provides us with a handle towards this because the proteins involved in GPCRs are exactly the same proteins that are happening to uh, be controlling a lot of disease. And ask yourselves, how come is it that when find, we find one drug, the next drug is harder to find? How come it is that if we know the molecule, we can't iteratively optimize it? If you know a molecule that says caffeine and it's um, a stimulant, why can't I say, oh, sure, I'll just move this hydrogen over or add another uh, carbon over here and it'll be less or more stimulating or whatever? We can't do that. How come it, the drug design is the only science, only field of engineering, if, it's, if it isn't that? that feels they need to call itself rational. It's the only field of science that says we are rational, of course. They call it rational drug design. I find that very suspect. If you have to tell me up front, you're being rational. <laughs> there are no drug design champions. In every other design kind of thing, we have car design champions, we have chip design champions. There's no drug design champions. It's a lottery and we've run out of money to keep buying more tickets. We need a completely new understanding of this. And olfaction does provide this because it's the same biology, it's the same proteins, it's the same ligands. If you manage to solve this problem, which is to predict what something will smell of and create it, which nobody can do, then you'll be able to actually uh, discover new drugs. Another attribute of it is if you have a model of how faction works and you want to test it, all you have to do is say, hmm, well, this thing I predict will smell like banana. Then you sniff it, and if it doesn't smell like banana, you can iteratively optimize your model. If you're going straight to drugs, you must do clinical trials. Those are extremely expensive. Um, I finish with this. I have co-founded um, uh, the Molecular Frontier Synchro Prize with the uh, Ben Norden, who, is, who was the chairman of the, the Nobel Selection Committee for Chemistry, Shuang Zhang, who is um, the man who invented those peptides that allow us to stabilize proteins, and several others. And this ended up being the first, we didn't realize until we did it, the first prize ever in the history of humanity that was given for good questions as opposed to good answers. And we give it every year to five girls and five boys in Sweden. It's called the Nobel for Kids. If you know any teachers or anybody, please go here, submit questions, you have to be under 18. Uh, and the uh, uh, judging board contains uh, 13 Nobel laureates. So some, some of the kids, even if those don't win, sometimes get handed the notes back on the questions. This has been driving my research uh, tremendously, it has changed my life, having to, not having to, enjoying reading thousands of questions every year, submitted from all over the world, 160 countries are represented so far. On my phone, every day I get questions from kids and they have driven a lot of the real research that goes in my lab and other labs. If you think that questions are more important than, or less important than answers, think again. Questions are actually driving most uh, evolution, and most adaptation, and most uh, technology. Can you guess who said that? Very good. Now, um, we can do a couple of questions, or I can spend one more minute showing you how you can trump every physicist. Which one? We can do the questions later. How about this? <laughs> what is it? This is what I learned from the kids. Okay, one time somebody asked this. Question. Okay, now it sounds funny, right? Well, everybody knows here, no matter how unscientific you may think, that the fastest thing in the universe is light. Nothing goes faster than light, right? Wrong. False. 
<laughs> wrong, very wrong, in fact. And you don't need to go to any weird quantum physics. And I have to admit, I am a quantum physicist by nature and by training. And if you understand what I'm about to tell you, which is very simple, you'll understand the Einstein Podolsky, uh, Rosen paradox, you'll understand entanglement, quantum computing, quantum teleportation, all these fancy things. Just consider this. If you have a flashlight, let's say, 60 degree angle, doesn't really matter, and you fire it off into the sky, and it goes one light year, you wait a year, you will have reached two planets, let's say, that are one light year apart after one year, correct? So here's my light. By the way, I'm writing this on Einstein's board, which is a little bit blasphemous. <laughs> so what happens then? We have A planet A planet B, here's the Earth, here's my flashlight. What happens then if on top of my flashlight I put my finger and I cover it and I go over the whole flashlight in one second? How fast will that shadow travel from A to B in one second? How far is A to B? One light year. So the shadow goes faster than light. Indeed, nothing goes faster than light. No thing goes faster than light. The absence of a thing does go faster than light. In fact, it can go at any speed, including infinite. What that means is correlations. What that means is patterns. What that means is pre-baked things that you've already associated to things before can do anything they want. And this is goes very deep. We don't have time to go into all of it, but in addition to all the quantum physics stuff, it also explains a lot about biology, how do cells self-organize so intricately and so quickly, because they don't we don't have to go into any crazy quantum physics, they're just pre-baked knowledge that happens there. So indeed, the velocity of shadows, class <coughs> of light, my class of light, the fact it can go all the way to infinite. And I did this in Einstein's home. <laughs> Thank you very much. By the way, while you're thinking of the questions, these are my collaborators. They're responsible for a lot of the things apart from the last one. Although the last one is very, very real, don't blame them for this. That's all mine. Go ahead with the question. Raise your hand. We've all been stumped. Okay. Well, no, no. I think we should. Anyway, uh, we, you can reach me uh, during the dinner. I'm very approachable. And in fact, I wanted to compliment this crowd. Uh, the quality of the questions that I heard yesterday and today, and especially on the plasma tour, was blew me away. Uh, especially from the people who you wouldn't expect to have such deep understanding of the, of the issue. People who self-identified as not being scientists asked really, really good questions. And I'm impressed with how young the crowd is. And I want to say, go, keep going with the questions. Don't take anything for granted. You are just as smart as everybody else. And, uh, I heard some comments, oh, do I need to do a math? Nope, you don't. And if anybody cannot explain what they're doing to you in about five seconds, then they don't know what they're doing. And you should push them on that and push them to explain it in five seconds uh, in the same way that a kid would understand it. <laughs>